Chapter One of The Two Gun Man. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Penn. The Two Gun Man by Charles Alden Seltzer. The Stranger at Dry Bottom. From the crest of Three Miles Slope, the man on the pony could see the town of Dry Bottom straggling across the gray floor of the flat its low squat buildings looking like so many old boxes blown there by an idle wind or unceremoniously dumped there by a careless fate and left regardless to carry out the scheme of desolation apparently the rider was in no hurry for as the pony topped the rise and the town burst suddenly into view the little animal pricked up its ears and quickened its pace only to feel the reins suddenly tighten and to hear the rider's voice gruffly discouraging haste therefore the pony pranced gingerly alert champing the bit impatiently picking its way over the lumpy hills of stone and cactus but holding closely to the trail the man lounged in the saddle his strong well-knit body swaying gracefully his eyes shaded by the brim of his hat narrowed with slight mockery and interest as he gazed steadily at the town that lay before him i reckon that must be dry bottom he said finally mentally taking in its dimensions if that's so i've only got twenty miles to go halfway down the slope and still a mile and a half from the town the rider drew the pony to a halt he dropped the reins over the high pommel of the saddle drew out his two guns one after the other rolled the cylinders and returned the guns to their holsters he had heard something of dry bottom's reputation and in examining his pistols he was merely preparing himself for an emergency for a moment after he had replaced the weapons he sat quietly in the saddle then he shook out the reins spoke to the pony and the little animal set forward at a slow lope an ironic traveller passing through dry bottom in its younger days before civic spirit had definitely centered its efforts upon things nomenclatural had hinted that the town should be known as dry because of the fact that while it boasted seven buildings four were saloons and that bottom might well be used as a suffix because in the nature of things a town of seven buildings four of which are saloons might reasonably expect to descend to the very depths of moral iniquity the ironic traveller had spoken with prophetic wisdom drybottom was trying as best it knew how to wallow in the depths of sin unlovely soiled desolate of verdure dumped down upon a flat of sand in a treeless waste amid cactus crabbed yucca scorpions horned toads and rattlesnakes drybottom had forgotten its morals subverted its principles and neglected its god as the rider approached to within a few hundred yards of the edge of town he became aware of a sudden commotion he reined in his pony allowing it to advance at a walk while with alert eyes he endeavored to search out the cause of the excitement he did not have long to watch for the explanation a man had stepped out of the door of one of the saloons slowly walking twenty feet away from it toward the center of the street immediately other men had followed but these came only to a point just outside the door for some reason which was not apparent to the rider they were giving the first men plenty of room the rider was now able to distinguish the faces of the men in the group and he gazed with interested eyes at the man who had first issued from the door of the saloon the man was tall nearly as tall as the rider and in his every movement seemed sure of himself he was young seemingly about thirty-five with shifty insolent eyes and a hard mouth whose lips were just now curved into a self-conscious smile the rider had now approached to within fifty feet of the man halting his pony at the extreme end of the hitching rail that skirted the front of the saloon he sat carelessly in the saddle his gaze fixed on the man the men who had followed the first man out to the number of a dozen were apparently deeply interested though plainly skeptical a short fat man who was standing near the saloon door looked on with a half sneer several others were smiling blandly a tall man on the extreme edge of the crowd near the rider was watching the man in the street gravely 
Other men had allowed various expressions to creep into their faces, but all were silent. Not so the man in the street. Plainly, here was conceit personified, and yet a conceit mingled with a maddening insolence. His expression told all that this thing which he was about to do was worthy of the closest attention. He was the axis upon which the interest of the universe revolved. Certainly he knew the attention he was attracting. Men were approaching from the other end of the street, joining the group in front of the saloon, which the writer now noticed was called the Silver Dollar. The newcomers were inquisitive. They spoke in low tones to the men who had arrived before them, gravely inquiring the cause. But the man in the street seemed not disturbed by his rapidly swelling audience. He stood in the place he had selected, his insolent eyes roving over the assembled company, his thin, expressive lips opening very little to allow words to filter through them. "'Gents,' he said, "'you're going to see some shooting. I told you in the silver dollar I could keep a can in the air while I put five holes in it. There's some of you gassed about being showed, not believing, and now I'm going to show you.' He reached down and took up a can that had lain at his feet, removing the red lithograph label, which had a picture of a large tomato in the center of it. The can was revealed, naked and shining in the white sunlight. The man placed the can in his left hand and drew his pistol with the right. Then he tossed the can into the air. While it still rose, his weapon exploded. The can shook spasmodically and turned clear over. Then, in rapid succession, followed four other explosions, the last occurring just before the can reached the ground. The man smiled, still holding the smoking weapon in his hand. The tall man on the extreme edge of the group now stepped forward and examined the can, while several other men crowded about to look. There were exclamations of surprise. It was curious to see how quickly enthusiasm and awe succeeded skepticism. "'He's done it, boys!' cried the tall man, holding the can aloft. Boarded in five places. He stood erect, facing the crowd. I reckon that's some shooting. He now threw a glance of challenge and defiance about him. I've got a hundred dollars to say that there ain't another man in this here town can do it. Several men tried, but none equaled the first man's performance. Many of the men could not hit the can at all. The first man watched their efforts, sneers twitching his lips as man after man failed presently all had tried watching closely the writer caught an expression of slight disappointment on the tall man's face the writer was the only man who had not yet tried his skill with the pistol and the man in the street now looked up at him his eyes glittering with an insolent challenge as it happened the writer glanced at the shooter at the instant the latter had turned to look up at him their eyes met fairly the shooters conveying a silent taunt. The writer smiled, slight mockery glinting his eyes. Apparently the stranger did not care to try his skill. He still sat lazily in the saddle, his gaze wandering languidly over the crowd. The latter plainly expected him to take part in the shooting match, and was impatient over his inaction. Two gun, sneered a man who stood near the saloon door. I wonder what he totes them two guns for. The shooter heard and turned toward the man who had spoken, his lips wreathed satirically. "'I reckon he wouldn't shoot nothing with him," he said, addressing the man who had spoken. Several men laughed. The tall man who had revealed interest before now raised a hand, checking further comments. "'That offer of a hundred to a man who can best that shooting still goes,' he declared, "'and I'm taking off the condition.' The man that tries don't have to belong to Dry Bottom. No stranger is barred. The stranger's glance again met the shooter's. The latter grinned felinely. Then the rider spoke. The crowd gave him its polite attention. I reckon you all think you've seen some shooting, he said in a steady, even voice, singularly free from boast. But I reckon you ain't seen any real shooting. He turned to the tall, grave-faced man. I ain't got no hundred, he said, but I'm going to show you. He still sat in the saddle, but now with an easy motion, he swung down and hitched his pony to the rail. End of chapter one.
Chapter Two of The Two Gun Man by Charles Alden Seltzer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Penn. The Stranger Shoots. The stranger seemed taller on the ground than in the saddle, and an admirable breadth of shoulder and slenderness of waist told eloquently of strength. He could not have been over twenty five or six, yet certain hard lines about his mouth, the glint of mockery in his eyes, the pronounced forward thrust of the chin, the indefinable force that seemed to radiate from him, told the casual observer that here was a man who must be approached with care. But apparently the shooter saw no such signs. In the first glance that had been exchanged between the two men, there had been a lack of ordinary cordiality. And now, as the rider slid down from his pony and advanced toward the center of the street, the shooter's lips curled. Writhing through them came slow-spoken words. You running sheep, stranger? The rider's lips smiled, but his eyes were steady and cold. In them shone a flash of cold humor. He stood quietly contemplating his insulter. Smiles appeared on the faces of several of the onlookers. The tall man with the grave face watched with a critical eye. The insult had been deliberate, and many men crouched, plainly expecting a serious outcome. But the stranger made no move toward his guns, and when he answered, he might have been talking about the weather, so casual was his tone. "'I reckon you think you're a plum man,' he said quietly. "'But if you are, you ain't showed it much. Button in with that there wise observation. And there's some men who think that shooting at a man is more exciting than shooting at a can.' There was a grim quality in his voice now. He leaned forward slightly, his eyes cold and alert. The shooter sneered experimentally. Again the audience smiled. But the tall man now stepped forward. "'You made your play, stranger,' he said quietly. "'I reckon it's up to you to make good.' "'Correct,' agreed the stranger. "'I'm going to show you some real shooting. "'You got another can?' Someone dived into the silver dollar and returned in a flash with another tomato can. This the stranger took, removing the label, as the shooter had done. Then, smiling, he took a position in the center of the street, the can in his right hand. He did not draw his weapon as the shooter had done, but stood loosely in his place, his right hand still grasping the can, the left swinging idly by his side. Apparently he did not mean to shoot. Sneers reached the faces of several men in the crowd. The shooter growled, Four flush. There was a flash as the can rose twenty feet in the air, propelled by the right hand of the stranger. As the can reached the apex of its climb, the stranger's right hand descended and grasped the butt of the weapon at his right hip. There was a flash as the gun came out, a gasp of astonishment from the watchers. The can was arrested in the first foot of its descent by the shock of the first bullet striking it. It jumped up and out and again began its interrupted fall, only to stop dead still in the air as another bullet struck it. There was an infinitesimal pause, and then twice more the can shivered and jumped. No man in the crowd but could tell that the bullets were striking true. The can was still ten feet in the air, and well out from the stranger. The latter whipped his weapon to a level, the bullet striking the can and driving it twenty feet from him. Then it dropped. But when it was within five feet of the ground, the stranger's gun spoke again. The can leaped, careening sideways, and fell, shattered, to the street, thirty feet distant from the stranger. Several men sprang forward to examine it. Six times!' ejaculated the tall man in an awed tone. And he didn't pull his gun till he throwed the can. He approached the stranger, drawing him confidentially aside. The crowd slowly dispersed, loudly proclaiming the stranger's ability with the six shooter. The latter took his honors lightly, the mocking smile again on his face. I'm looking for a man who can shoot, said the tall man, when the last man in the crowd had disappeared into the saloon. The stranger smiled. I reckon you've just seen some shooting he returned. The tall man smiled mirthlessly. You particular about what you shoot at? 
he inquired. The stranger's lips straightened coldly. I used to have that habit, he returned evenly. Hard luck? queried the tall man. I'm rolling in wealth, stated the stranger with an ironic sneer. The tall man's eyes glittered. Where are you from? he questioned. You can have three guesses, returned the stranger, his eyes narrowing with the mockery that the tall man had seen in them before. The tall man adopted a placative tone. I ain't wantin' to butt into your business, he said. I was wantin' to find out if anyone around here knowed ya. This town didn't send any reception committee to meet me, did they? smiled the stranger. Correct, said the tall man. He leaned closer. You willing to work your guns for me for a hundred a month? The stranger looked steadily into the tall man's eyes. You've been right handy asking questions, he said. Maybe you'll answer some. What's your name? Stafford, returned the tall man. I'm managing the two diamond over on the ute. The stranger's eyelashes flickered slightly. His eyes narrowed quizzically. What you wantin' of a gunman? he asked. Rustler, returned the other shortly. The stranger smiled. Figure on shooting him? he questioned. Stafford hesitated. Well, no, he returned. That is, not until I'm sure I got the right one. He seized the stranger's arm in a confidential grip. You see, he explained, I don't know just where I'm at. There's been a rustler working on the herd, and I ain't been able to get close enough to find out who it is. But rustling has got to be stopped. I've sent over to Raton to get a man named Ned Ferguson, who's been working for Sid Tucker of the Lazy J. Tucker wrote me quite a while back, telling me that this man was plumb slick at nosing out rustlers. He was to come to the Two Diamond two weeks ago, but he ain't showed up, and I'm about concluded that he ain't coming. And so I come over to Dry Bottom to find a man. You found one, smiled the stranger. Stafford drew out a handful of double eagles and pressed them into the other's hand. I'm going over to the Two Diamond now, he said. You better wait a day or two, so's no one will get wise. Come right to me like you was wanting a job. He started toward the hitching rail for his pony, hesitated, and then walked back. I didn't get your name, he smiled. The stranger's eyes glittered humorously. It's Ferguson, he said quietly. Stafford's eyes widened with astonishment. Then his right hand went out and grasped the others. Well, now he said warmly. That's what I call luck. Ferguson smiled. Maybe it is luck, he returned. But before I go over to work for you, there's got to be an understanding. I can shoot some, he continued, looking steadily at Stafford. But I ain't running around a country shooting men without cause. I'm willing to try and find your rustler for you, but I ain't shooting him unless he goes to crowding me mighty close. I'm agreeing to that, returned Stafford. He turned again, looking back over his shoulder. You'll sure be over? he questioned. I'll be there a day after tomorrow, stated Ferguson. He turned and went into the silver dollar. Stafford mounted his pony and loped rapidly out of town. End of chapter 2《Chapter Three of the Two Gun Man by Charles Alden Seltzer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Penn. The Cabin in the Flat. It was the day appointed by Ferguson for his presence at the Two Diamond Ranch, and he was going to keep his word. Three hours out of Dry Bottom, he had struck the Ute Trail and was loping his pony through a cottonwood that skirted the river. It was an enchanted country through which he rode a land of vast distances of white sunlight blue skies and clear pure air mountains rose in the distances their snow-capped peaks showing above the clouds like bald rock spires above the calm level of the sea over the mountains swam the sun its lower rim slowly disappearing behind the peaks throwing off broad white shafts of light that soon began to dim as very colors rising in a slumberous haze like a gauze veil mingled with them 
Ferguson's gaze wandered from the trail to the red buttes that fringed the river. He knew this world. There was no novelty here for him. He knew the lava beds, looming gray and dead beneath the foothills. He knew the grotesque rock shapes that seemed to hint of a mysterious past. Nature had not altered her face. On the broad levels were the yellow-tinted lines that told of the presence of soapweed, the dark lines that betrayed the mesquite, the sacatone belts that marked the little gullies. Then there were the baranacas, the arid stretches where the sagebrush and the cactus grew. Snaky okatia dotted the space. The crab yucca had not lost its ugliness. Ferguson looked upon the world with unseeing eyes. He had lived here long, and the country had not changed. It would never change. Nothing ever changed here but the people. But he himself had not changed. Twenty-seven years in this country was a long time, for here life was not measured by age, but by experience. Looking back over the years, he could see that he was living today as he had lived last year, as he had lived during the last decade. A hard life, but having its compensations. His coming to the Two Diamond Ranch was merely another of those incidents that, during the past year, had broken the monotony of range life for him. He had had some success in breaking up a band of cattle thieves, which had made existence miserable for Sid Tucker, his employer, and the latter had recommended him to Stafford. The promise of high wages had been attractive, and so he had come. He had not expected to surprise anyone. When, during his conversations with the tall man in Dry Bottom, he had discovered that the latter was the man for whom he was to work, he had been surprised himself. But he had not revealed his surprise. Experience and association with men who kept their emotions pretty much to themselves had taught him the value of repression when in the presence of others. But alone, he allowed his emotions full play. There was no one to see, no one to hear, and the silence and the distances and the great swimming blue sky would not tell. Stafford's action in coming to Dry Bottom for a gunfighter had puzzled him not a little. Apparently the Two Diamond manager was intent upon the death of the rustler he had mentioned. He had been searching for a man who could shoot, he had said. Ferguson had interpreted this to mean that he desired to employ a gunfighter who would not scruple to kill any man he pointed out, whether innocent or guilty. He had had some experience with unscrupulous ranch managers, and he had admired them very little. Therefore, during the ride today, his lips had curled sarcastically many times. Riding through a wide clearing in the cottonwood, he spoke a thought that had troubled him not a little since he had entered Stafford's employ. Why, he said as he rode along, sitting carelessly in the saddle, he's wanting to make a gunfighter out of me. But I reckon I ain't gonna shoot no man, unless I'm pretty sure he's gunning for me. His lips curled ironically. I wonder what the boys at the Lazy J would think if they know that a guy was trying to make a gunfighter out of their old straw boss. I reckon they'd think that guy was loco, or a heap mistaken in his man. But I'm seeing this thing through. I ain't riding a hundred miles just to take a look at the man who's hiring me. It'll be a change. And when I go back to the Lazy J, it was not the pony's fault. Neither was it Ferguson's. The pony was experienced. Behind his slant eyes was stored a world of horse wisdom that had pulled him and his rider through many tight places. And Ferguson had ridden horses all his life. He would not have known what to do without one. But the pony stumbled. The cause was a prairie dog hole, concealed under a clump of matted mesquite. Ferguson lunged forward, caught at the saddle horn, missed it, and pitched head foremost out of the saddle, turning completely over and alighting upon his feet. He stood erect for an instant, but the momentum had been too great. He went down, and when he tried to rise, a twinge of pain in his right ankle brought a grimace to his face. He arose and hopped over to a flat rock, near where his pony now stood, grazing as though nothing had happened. Drawing off his boot, Ferguson made a rapid examination of the ankle. It was inflamed and painful, but not broken. 
He believed he could see it swelling. He rubbed it, hoping to assuage the pain. The woolen sock interfered with the rubbing, and he drew it off. For a few minutes he worked with the ankle, but to little purpose. He finally became convinced that it was a bad sprain, and he looked up, scowling. The pony turned an inquiring eye upon him, and he grinned, suddenly smitten with the humor of the situation. "'You ain't got no call to look so doggone innocent about it,' he said. "'If you'd been tending to your business, you wouldn't have stepped into no damn gopher hole.' The pony moved slowly away, and he looked whimsically after it, remarking, "'Maybe if I'd been tending to my business, it wouldn't have happened either.' He spoke again to the pony. "'I reckon you know that too, Mustard, and you're some wise.' The animal was now at some little distance from the rock upon which he was sitting. He arose, hobbling on one foot toward it, carrying the discarded boot in his hand. He thought of riding with the foot bare. At the two diamond he was sure to find some sort of liniment which, with the help of a bandage, would materially assist nature in... He was passing a filmy mesquite clump, the bare foot swinging wide. There was a warning rattle a sharp thrust of a flat brown head. Ferguson halted in astonishment, almost knocked off his balance with the suddenness of the attack. He still held the boot, his fingers gripping it tightly. He raised it with a purely involuntary motion, as though to hurl it at his insidious enemy, but he did not. The arm fell to his side, and his face slowly whitened. He stared dully and uncomprehendingly at the sinuous shape that was slipping noiselessly away through the matted grass. Somehow he had never thought of being bitten by a rattler. He had seen so many of them that he had come to look upon them only as targets at which he might shoot when he thought he needed practice. And now he was bitten. The unreality of the incident surprised him. He looked around at the silent hills, at the sun that swam above the mountain peaks, at the great vast arc of sky that yawned above him. Hills, sky, and sun seemed all so unreal. It was as though he had been suddenly thrust into a land of dreams. But presently the danger of the situation burst upon him, and he lived once more in the reality. He looked down at his foot. A livid pinpoint wound showed in the flesh beside the arch. A tiny stream of blood was oozing from it. He forgot the pain of the sprained ankle and stood upon both feet, his body suddenly rigid, his face red with a sudden consuming anger, shaking a tense fist at the disappearing rattler. You damn sneak! he shouted shrilly. In the same instant, he had drawn one of his heavy guns and swung it over his head. Its crashing report brought a sudden swishing from beneath the grass, and he hopped over closer and sent three more bullets into the threshing brown body. He stood over it for a moment, his teeth showing in a savage snarl. "'You won't bite anyone else, damn you!' he shouted. The impotence of this conduct struck him immediately. He flushed and dropped his head, a grim smile slowly wearing down his expression of panic. Seldom did he allow his emotions to reveal themselves so plainly. But the swiftness of the rattler's attack, the surprise when he had not been thinking of such a thing, the fact that he was far from help and that his life was in danger, all had a damaging effect upon his self-control. And yet the smile showed that he was still master of himself. Very deliberately, he returned to the rock upon which he had been sitting, ripping off his coat and tearing away the sleeve of his woolen shirt. Twisting the sleeve into the form of a rude rope, he tied it loosely around his leg, just above the ankle. Then he thrust his knife between the improvised rope and the leg, forming a crude tourniquet. He twisted the knife until tears of pain formed in his eyes. Then he fastened the knife by tucking the haft under the rope. His movements had been very deliberate, but sure, and in a few minutes he hobbled to the pony and swung into the saddle. He had seen men who had been bitten by rattlers. He had seen them die, and he knew that if he did not get help within half an hour, there would be little use of doing anything further. In half an hour, the virus would have so great a grip upon him 
that it would be practically useless to apply any of the antidotes commonly known to the inhabitants of the country. Inquiries that he had made at Dry Bottom had resulted in the discovery that the Two Diamond Ranch was nearly thirty miles from the town. If he had averaged eight miles an hour, he had covered about twenty-four miles of the distance. That would still leave about six, and he could not hope to ride those six miles in time to get any benefit from an antidote. His lips straightened. He stared grimly at a ridge of somber hills that fringed the skyline. They had told him back in Dry Bottom that the Two Diamond Ranch was somewhere in a big basin below those hills. I reckon I won't get there after all, he said, commenting aloud. Thereafter he rode grimly on, keeping a good grip upon himself, for he had seen men bitten by rattlers who had lost their self-control, and they had not been good to look upon. Much depended upon coolness. Somewhere he had heard that it was a mistake for a bitten man to exert himself in the first few minutes following a bite. Exertion caused the virus to circulate more rapidly through the system, and so he rode at an even pace, carefully avoiding the rough spots, though keeping as closely to the trail as possible. If it hadn't been a diamond back, and a five-foot one, this rope that I got around my leg might be enough to fool him, he said once aloud. But I reckon he's got me. His eyes lighted savagely for an instant. But I got him, too. Had the nerve to think that he could get away after throwing his hooks into me. Presently his eyes caught the saffron light that glowed in the western sky. He laughed with a grim humor. I've heard tell that a snake don't die till sundown, much as you heard him. If that's so, and I don't get to where I can get some help, I reckon it'll be a standoff between him and me as to who's going first. A little later he drew Mustard to a halt, sitting very erect in the saddle and fixing his gaze upon a tall cottonwood tree that rose near the trail. His heart was racing madly, and in spite of his efforts, he felt himself swaying from side to side. He had often seen a rattler doing that, flat, ugly head raised above his coiled body, forked tongue shooting out, his venomous eyes glittering, the head and the part of the body rising above the coils swaying gracefully back and forth. Yes, gracefully, for in spite of his hideous aspect, there was a certain horrible ease of movement about a rattler a slippery, sinuous motion that partly revealed reserved strength and hinted at repressed energy. Many times while watching them, he had been fascinated by their grace, and now, sitting in the saddle, he caught himself wondering if the influence of a bite were great enough to cause a person bitten to imitate the snake. He laughed when this thought struck him, and drove his spurs sharply against Mustard's flanks, riding forward past the cottonwood at which he had been staring. Hell, he ejaculated as he passed the tree. What a fool notion. But he could not banish the notion from his mind, and five minutes later, when he tried again to sit steadily, he found the swaying more pronounced. The saddle seemed to rock with him, and even by jamming his uninjured foot tightly into the oxbow stirrup, he could not stop swaying. Maybe I won't get very far, he said, realizing that the poison had entered his system and that presently it would riot in his veins. But I'm going on till I stop. I wouldn't want that damn rattler to know that he had made me quit so soon. He urged Mustard to a faster pace, even while realizing that speed was hopeless. He could never reach the two diamond. Convinced of this, he halted the pony again, swaying in the saddle, and holding for the first time to the pommel in an effort to steady himself but he still swayed. He laughed mockingly. Now, what do you think of that? He said, addressing the silence. You might think I was plumb tenderfoot and didn't know how to ride a horse proper. He urged the pony onward again, and for some little time rode with bowed head, trying to keep himself steady by watching the trail. He rode through a little clearing where the grass was matted and some naked rocks reared aloft. Near a clump of sagebrush, he saw a sudden movement, a rattler trying to slip away unnoticed. But the snake slid into Ferguson's vision, and with a sneer of hate, 
he drew one of his weapons and whipped it over his head. Its roar awakened echoes in the wood. Twice, three times, the crashing report sounded, but the rattler whisked away and disappeared into the grass, apparently uninjured. For an instant, Ferguson scowled. Then a grin of mockery reached his flushed face. I reckon I'm done, he said. Can't even hit a rattler no more. And him a brother or sister of that other one. A delirious light flashed upon his eyes, and he seemed on the point of dismounting. I'll certainly smash you some, he said, speaking to the snake, which he could no longer see. I ain't gonna let no snake bite me and get away with it. But he now smiled guiltily, embarrassment shining in his eyes. I reckon that wasn't the snake that bit you, Ferguson, he said. The one that bit you is back on the trail. He ain't going to die till sundown. Not till sundown, he repeated mechanically, grimly. Ferguson ain't going to die till sundown. He rode on, giving no attention to the pony whatever, but letting the reins fall and holding to the pommel of the saddle. His face was burning now, his hands were twitching, and an unnatural gleam had come into his eyes. "'Ferguson got hooked by a rattler!' he suddenly exclaimed, hilarity in his voice. "'He run plumb into that reptile, tried to walk on him with a bare foot.' The laugh was checked as suddenly as it had come, and a grim quality entered his voice. "'But Ferguson wasn't no tenderfoot. He didn't scare none. He went right on, not saying anything. You see, he was reckoning to be man's size. He rode on a little way, and as he entered another clearing, a rational gleam came into his eyes. I must still a goin' it, he muttered. A shadow darkened the trail. He heard mustard whinny. He became aware of a cabin in front of him heard an exclamation, saw dimly the slight figure of a woman sitting on a small porch, as through a mist he saw her rise and approach him, standing on the edge of the porch, looking at him. He smiled, bowing low to her over his pony's mane. "'I shot him, ma'am,' he said gravely. "'But he ain't gonna die till sundown.' As from some great distance a voice seemed to come to him, Mercy, it said. What is wrong? Who is shot? Why, the snake, ma'am, he returned thickly. He slid down from his pony and staggered to the edge of the porch, leaning against one of the slender posts and hanging dizzily on. You see, ma'am, that damn rattler got Ferguson. But Ferguson ain't reckoning on dying till sundown. He couldn't let no snake get the best of him. He saw the woman start toward him, felt her hands on his arms, helping him upon the porch. Then he felt her hands on his shoulders, felt them pressing him down. He felt dimly that there was a chair under him, and he sank into it, leaning back and stretching himself out full length. A figure flitted before him, and presently there was a sharp pain in his foot. He started out of the chair and was abruptly shoved back into it. Then the figure leaned over him, prying his jaws apart with some metal-like object and pouring something down his throat. He clicked as he swallowed, vainly trying to brush away the object. "'You're a hell of a snake,' he said savagely. Then the world blurred dizzily and he drifted into oblivion. End of chapter 3《Chapter Four of the Two Gun Man by Charles Alden Seltzer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Penn. A different girl. Ferguson had no means of knowing how long he was unconscious, but when he awoke, the sun had gone down and the darkening shadows had stolen into the clearing near the cabin. He still sat in the chair on the porch. He tried to lift his injured foot, and found to his surprise that some weight seemed to be on it. He struggled to an erect position, looking down. His foot had been bandaged, and the weight that he had thought was upon it was not a weight at all, but the hands of a young woman. 
She sat on the porch floor, the injured foot in her lap, and she had just finished bandaging it. Beside her on the porch floor was a small black medicine case, a sponge, some yards of white cloth, and a tin wash basin partly filled with water. He had a hazy recollection of the young woman. He knew it must have been she that he had seen when he had ridden up to the porch. He also had a slight remembrance of having spoken to her, but what the words were he could not recall. He stretched himself painfully. The foot pained frightfully, and his face felt hot and feverish. He was woefully weak, and his nerves were tingling. But he was alive. The girl looked up at his movement. Her lips opened, and she held up a warning hand. You are to be very quiet, she admonished. He smiled weakly and obeyed her, leaning back, his gaze on the slate blue of the sky. She still worked at the foot, fastening the bandage. He could feel her fingers as they passed lightly over it. He did not move, feeling a deep contentment. Presently she arose, placed the foot gently down, and entered the house. With closed eyes he lay in the chair, listening to her step as she walked about in the house. He lay there a long time, and when he opened his eyes again he knew that he must have been asleep, for the night had come and a big yellow moon was rising over a rim of distant hills. Turning his head slightly, he saw the interior of one of the rooms of the cabin, the kitchen, for he saw a stove and some kettles and pans hanging on the wall, and near the window a table over which was spread a cloth. A small kerosene lamp stood in the center of the table, its rays glimmering weakly through the window. He raised one hand and passed it over his forehead. There was still some fever, but he felt decidedly better than when he had awakened the first time. Presently he heard a light step and became aware of someone standing near him. He knew it was the girl, even before she spoke, for he had caught the rustle of her dress. "'Are you awake?' she questioned. "'Why, yes, ma'am,' he returned. He turned to look at her, but in the darkness he could not see her face." "'Do you feel like eating anything?' she asked. He grinned ruefully in the darkness. "'I couldn't say that I'm exactly yearning for grub,' he returned. "'Though I ain't done any eating since morning. I reckon a rattler's bite ain't considered to help a man's appetite any.' He heard her laugh softly. "'No,' she returned. "'I wouldn't recommend it. He tried again to see her, but could not, and so he relaxed and turned his gaze on the sky. But presently he felt her hand on his shoulder, and then her voice, as she spoke firmly. "'You can't lie here all night,' she said. "'You would be worse in the morning, and it is impossible for you to travel tonight. I'm going to help you to get into the house. You can lean your weight on my shoulder.' He struggled to an erect position and made out her slender figure in the dim light from the window. He would have been afraid of crushing her, could he have been induced to accept her advice. He got to his uninjured foot, and began to hop toward the door, but she was beside him instantly, protesting. Stop, she commanded firmly. If you do that, it will be the worse for you. Put your hand on my shoulder. In the darkness he could see her eyes flash with determination. And so, without further objection, he placed a hand lightly on her shoulder, and in this manner they made their way through the door and into the cabin. Once inside the door, he halted, blinking at the light, and undecided. But she promptly led him towards another door, into a room containing a bed. She led him to the bedside, and stood near him after he had sunk down upon it. "'You are to sleep here tonight,' she said. "'Tomorrow—' If you are considerably better, I may allow you to travel. She went out, returning immediately with a small bottle containing medicine. If you feel worse during the night, she directed, you must take a spoonful from that bottle. If you think you need anything else, don't hesitate to call. I shall be in the next room. He started to voice his thanks, but she cut him short with a laugh. Good night, she said. Then she went out and closed the door after her. He awoke several times during the night, and each time took a taste of the medicine in the bottle. 
but shortly after midnight he fell into a heavy sleep from which he did not awaken until the dawn had come he lay quiet for a long time until he heard steps in the kitchen and then he rose and went to the door throwing it open and standing on the threshold she was standing near the table a coffee pot in her hand her eyes widened as she saw him oh she exclaimed you're very much better he smiled i'm thanking you for it ma'am he returned i certainly wouldn't have been feeling anything if i hadn't met you when i did she put the coffee pot down and looked gravely at him you were in very bad shape when you came she admitted there was a time when i thought my remedies would not pull you through they would not had you come five minutes later he had no reply to make to this and he stood there silent until she poured coffee into a cup arranged some dishes and then invited him to sit at the table he needed no second invitation for he had been twenty-four hours without food and he had little excuse to complain of the quality of the food that was set before him he ate in silence and when he had finished he turned away from the table to see the girl dragging a rocking chair out upon the porch she returned immediately smiling at him your chair is ready she said i think you had better not exert yourself very much today. why ma'am he expostulated i'm feeling right well i reckon i could be traveling now i ain't used to being babied this way i don't think you're being babied she returned a trifle coldly i don't think i'd waste any time with anyone if i thought it wasn't necessary i'm merely telling you to remain for your own good of course if you wish to disregard my advice you may do so he smiled with a frank embarrassment and limped toward the door why ma'am he said regretfully as he reached the door i certainly don't want to do anything which you think ain't right after what you've done for me i don't want to belittle you and i think that when i said that i might have been gassing a little but i thought maybe i'd been enough trouble already it was not entirely the confession itself but the self-accusing tone in which it had been uttered that brought a smile to her face all the same she said you are to do as i tell you he smiled as he dropped into the chair on the porch it was an odd experience for him never before in his life had anyone adopted toward him an air of even partial proprietorship he had been accustomed to having people always men meet him upon a basis of equality and if a man had adopted toward him the tone that she had employed there would have been an instant severing of diplomatic relations and a beginning of hostilities but this situation was odd a woman had ordered him to do a certain thing and he was obeying realizing that in doing so he was violating a principle though conscious of a strange satisfaction he knew that he had promised the two diamond manager and he was convinced that in spite of the pain in his foot he was well enough to ride but he was not going to ride her command had settled that for a long time he sat in the chair looking out over a great stretch of flat country which was rimmed on three sides by a fringe of low hills and behind him by the cottonwood the sun had been up long it was swimming above the rim of distant hills a ball of molten silver in a shimmering white blur the cabin was set squarely in the center of a big clearing and about an eighth of a mile behind him was a river the river that he had been following when he had been bitten by the rattler he knew from the location of the cabin that he had not gone very far out of his way that a ride of an eighth of a mile would bring him to the two diamond trail and he could not be very far from the two diamond yet because of an order issued by a girl he was doomed to delay his appearance at the ranch he had seen no man about the cabin did the girl live here alone he was convinced that no woman could long survive the solitude of this great waste of country some man a brother or a husband must share the cabin with her several times he caught himself hoping that if there was a man here it might be a brother or even a distant relative the thought that she might have a husband aroused in him a sensation of vague disquiet he heard her moving about in the cabin 
heard the rattle of dishes, the swish of a broom on the rough floor, and then presently she came out dragging another rocker. Then she re-entered the cabin, returning with a strip of striped cloth and a sewing basket. She seated herself in the chair, placed the basket in her lap, and with a half-smile on her face began to ply the needle. He lay back contentedly and watched her. Hers was a lithe, vigorous figure in a white apron and a checkered dress of some soft material. She wore no collar. Her sleeves were shoved up above her elbows, revealing a pair of slightly brown hands and white rounded arms. Her eyes were brown as her hair, the latter in a tumble of graceful disorder. Through half-closed eyes, he was appraising her in a riot of admiration that threatened completely to bias his judgment. And yet women had interested him very little. Perhaps that was because he had never seen a woman like this one. The women that he had known had been those of the Plains Town, the unfortunates who, through circumstances or inclination, had been drawn into the maelstrom of cow-country vice, and who, while they may have found flattery, were never objects of honest admiration or respect. He had known this young woman only a few hours, and yet he knew that with her he could not adopt the easy, matter-of-fact intimacy that had answered with the other women he had known. In fact, the desire to look upon her in this light never entered his mind, Instead, he was filled with a deep admiration for her, an admiration in which there was a profound respect. "'I expect you must know your business, ma'am,' he said after watching her for a few minutes. "'And I'm mighty glad that you do. Most women would have been pretty near flustered over a snake-bite. "'Why?' she returned, without looking up, but exhibiting a little embarrassment, which betrayed itself in a slight flush." I really think I was a little excited, especially when you came riding up to the porch. She thought of his words, when, looking at her accusingly, he had told her that she was a hell of a snake, and the flush grew, suffusing her face. This, of course, he had not known, and never would know, but the words had caused her many smiles during the night. You didn't show it much, he observed. You must have took right a hold. Some women would have gone clean off the handle. They wouldn't have been able to do anything. Her lips twitched, but she still gave her attention to the sewing, treating his little talk with a mild interest. There's nothing about a snake bite to become excited over, that is, if treatment is applied in time. In your case, the tourniquet kept the poison from getting very far into your system. If you hadn't thought of that, it might have gone very hard with you. That rope around my leg wouldn't have done me a bit of good, though, ma'am, if I hadn't a stumbled onto your cabin. I don't know when seeing a woman has pleased me more. She smiled enigmatically, her eyelashes flickering slightly, but she did not answer. Until noon she sewed, and he lay lazily back in the chair, watching her sometimes, sometimes looking at the country around him. They talked very little. Once, when he had been looking at her for a long time, she suddenly raised her eyes, and they met his fairly. Both smiled, but he saw a blush mantle her cheeks. At noon she rose and entered the cabin. A little later she called to him, telling him that dinner was ready. He washed from the tin basin that stood on the bench, just outside the door, and entering, sat at the table, and ate heartily. After dinner he did not see her again for a time, and, becoming wearied of the chair, he set out on a short excursion to the river. When he returned, she was seated on the porch and looked up at him with a demure smile. "'You will be quite active by tomorrow, she said. "'I ain't feeling exactly lazy now,' he returned, showing a surprising agility in reaching his chair." When the sun began to swim low over the hills, he looked at her with a curiously grim smile. "'I reckon that rattler was fool last night,' he said. "'But if fooling him had been left to me, I expect I'd have made a bad job of it. But I'm thinking that he done his little old dying when the sun went down last night, and I'm still here. And I'll keep right on, 
using his brothers and sisters for targets, when I think that I'm needing practice. Then you killed the snake? Why, sure, ma'am. I wasn't figuring on letting that rattler go a uh, fanning right on to hook someone else. That'd be encouraging his trade. She laughed, evidently pleased over his earnestness. Oh, I see, she said. Then you were not angry merely because he bit you? You killed him to keep him from attacking other persons? He smiled. I sure was some angry, he returned. And I reckon that just at the time I wasn't thinking much about other people. I was having plenty to keep me busy. But you killed him. How? Why, I shot him, ma'am. Was you thinking that I beat him to death with something? Her lips twitched again, the corners turning suggestively inward. But now he caught her looking at his guns. She looked from them to his face. All cowboys do not carry two guns, she said suddenly. He looked gravely at her. Well, no, ma'am, they don't. There are some that claim carrying two guns is clumsy. But there's been times when I found him right convenient. She fell silent now, regarding her sewing. A quizzical smile had reached his face. This exchange of talk had developed the fact that she was a stranger to the country. No western girl would have made her remark about the guns. He did not know whether or not he was pleased over the discovery. Certain subtle signs about her warned him in the beginning that she was different from other women of his acquaintance. But he had not thought of her being a stranger here, of her coming here from some other section of the country, the East, for instance. Her being from the East would account for many things. First, it would make it plain to him why she had smiled several times during their talks over things in which he had been able to see no humor. Then it would answer the question that had formed in his mind concerning the fluency of her speech. Western girls that he had met had not attained that ease and poise which he saw was hers naturally. Yet, in spite of this accomplishment, she was none the less a woman, demure-eyed, ready to blush and become confused as easily as a Western woman. Assured of this, he dropped the slight constraint which, up till now, had been plain in his voice, and an inward humor seemed to drive the corners of his mouth slightly downward. I reckon that folks where you come from don't wear guns at all, ma'am, he said slowly. She looked up quickly, surprised into meeting his gaze fairly. His eyes did not waver. She rocked vigorously, showing some embarrassment and giving undue attention to her sewing. How do you know that? she questioned, raising her head and looking at him with suddenly defiant eyes. I'm not aware that I told you that I was a stranger here. Don't you think you are guessing now? His eyes narrowed cunningly. I don't think I need to do any guessing, ma'am, he returned. When a man sees a different girl, he don't have to guess none. The different girl was regarding him with furtive glances, plainly embarrassed under his direct words. But there was much defiance in her eyes, as though she was aware of the trend of his words and was determined to outwit him. I think you must be a remarkable man, she said, with the faintest trace of mockery in her voice. To be able to discover such a thing so quickly. Or perhaps it is the atmosphere. It is marvelous. I expect it ain't exactly marvelous, he returned, laboring with the last word. When a girl acts different, a man is pretty apt to know it. He leaned forward a little, speaking earnestly. I know that I'm talking pretty plain to you, ma'am, he went on. But when a man has been bit by a rattler, and a sort of give up hope, and has had his life saved by a girl, he's to be excused if he feels that he's some acquainted with the girl. And then, when he finds that she's some different from the girls he'd been used to seeing, I don't see why he hadn't ought to take a lot of interest in her. Oh, she exclaimed her eyes drooping, and then her eyes dancing as they shot a swift glance at him. I should call that a pretty speech. He reddened with embarrassment. I expect you're laughing at me now, ma'am, he said. But I wasn't thinking of making any pretty speeches. 
I was telling you the truth. She soberly plied her needle, and he sat back watching her. I expect you are a stranger round here yourself, she said presently, her eyes covered with drooping lashes. How do you know that you have any right to sit there and tell me that you take an interest in me? How do you know that I'm not married? He was not disconcerted. He drawled slightly over his words when he answered. You wouldn't listen to me at all, ma'am. You certainly wouldn't stay and listen to any speeches that you thought was pretty. If you was married, he said. Plainly, he had not lost faith in the virtue of woman. But if I did listen, she questioned, her face crimson, though her eyes were still defiant. He regarded her with pleased eyes. I've been looking for a wedding ring, he said. She gave it up in confusion. I don't know why I'm talking this way to you, she said. I expect it is because there isn't anything else to do. But you really are entertaining, she declared for a parting shot. Once Ferguson had seen a band of traveling minstrels in Cimarron. Their jokes, of an ancient vintage, had taken well with the audience, for the latter had laughed. Ferguson remembered that a stranger had said that the minstrels were entertaining, and now he was entertaining her. A shadow passed over his face. He looked down at his foot, with its white bandage so much in evidence, then straight at her, his eyes grave and steady. "'I'm glad to have amused you, ma'am,' he said. "'And now I reckon I'll be getting over to the Two Diamond. "'You can't be very far now.' Five miles,' she said shortly. She had dropped her sewing into her lap and sat motionless, regarding him with level eyes. "'Are you working for the Two Diamond?' she questioned. "'Looking for a job,' he returned. "'Oh!' The exclamation struck him as rather expressionless. He looked at her. Do you know the two diamond folks? Of course. Of course, he repeated, aware of the constraint in her voice. I ought to have known. They're neighbors of yourn. They are not, she suddenly flashed back at him. Well, now, he returned slowly, puzzled, but knowing that somehow he was getting things wrong. I reckon there's a lot that I don't know. If you're going to work over at the Two Diamond, she said coldly, you will know more than you do now. My... Evidently she was about to say something more, but a sound caught her ear, and she rose, dropping her sewing to the chair. My brother is coming, she said quietly. Standing near the door, she caught Ferguson's swift glance. Then it ain't a husband after all he said, pretending a surprise. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 of The Two-Gun Man by Charles Alden Seltzer This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Penn The Man of Dry Bottom A young man rode around the corner of the cabin and halted his pony beside the porch sitting quietly in the saddle and gazing inquiringly at the two. He was about Ferguson's age, and, like the latter, he wore two heavy guns. There was about him, as he sat there sweeping a slow glance over the girl and the man, a certain atmosphere of deliberate certainty and quiet coldness that gave an impression of readiness for whatever might occur. Ferguson's eyes lighted with satisfaction. The girl might be an Easterner, but the young man was plainly at home in this country. Nowhere, except in the West, could he have acquired the serene calm that shone out of his eyes. In no other part of the world could he have caught the easy assurance, the unstudied nonchalance, that seems the inherent birthright of the cowpuncher. Ben, said the girl, answering the young man's glance, this man was bitten by a rattler. He came here and I treated him. He says he was on his way over to the Two Diamond for a job. The young man opened his lips slightly. Stafford hire you? he asked. I'm hoping he does, returned Ferguson. The young man's lips drooped sneeringly. I reckon you're wanting a job mighty bad, he said. Ferguson smiled. Taking your talk, you and Stafford ain't very good friends, he returned. 
The young man did not answer. He dismounted and led his pony to a small corral, and then returned to the porch, carrying his saddle. For an instant after the young man had left the porch to turn his pony into the corral, Ferguson had kept his seat on the porch. But something in the young man's tone had brought him out of the chair, determined to accept no more of his hospitality. If the young man was no friend of Stafford, it followed that he could not feel well disposed to a puncher who had avowed that his purpose was to work for the two-diamond manager. Ferguson was on his feet, clinging to one of the slender porch posts, preparatory to stepping down to go to his pony, when the young woman came out. Her sharp exclamation halted him. "'You're not going now,' she said. "'You have got to remain perfectly quiet until morning.' The brother dropped his saddle to the porch floor, grinning mildly at Ferguson. "'You don't need to be in a hurry,' he said. "'I was intending to run your horse into the corral. What I meant about Stafford don't apply to you.' He looked up at his sister, still grinning. "'I reckon he ain't got nothing to do with it?' The young woman blushed. "'I hope not,' she said in a low voice. "'We're going to eat pretty soon,' said the young man. I reckon that rattler didn't take your appetite. Ferguson flushed. It was plum ridiculous, me being hooked by a rattler, he said. And I've lived among em so long. I reckon you let him get away? questioned the young man evenly. If he's got away, returned Ferguson, his lips straightening with satisfaction. He's a right smart snake. He related the incident of the attack, ending with praises of the young woman's skill. The young man smiled at the reference to his sister. She studied medicine back east. Lately she's turned her hand to writing. Come out here to get experience. Local color, she calls it. Ferguson sat back in his chair, quietly digesting this bit of information. Medicine and writing. What did she write? Love stories? Fairy tales? Romances? He had read several of these. Mostly they were absurd and impossible. Love stories, he thought, would be easy for her. For, he said, mentally estimating her, a woman ought to know more about love than a man. And, as for anything being impossible in a love story, why, most anything could happen to people who are in love. Supper is ready, he heard her announce from within. Ferguson preceded the young man at the tin wash basin, taking a fresh towel that the young woman offered him from the doorway. Then he followed the young man inside. The three took places at the table, and Ferguson was helped to a frugal, though wholesome meal. The dusk had begun to fall while they were yet at the table, and the young woman arose, lighting a kerosene lamp and placing it on the table. By the time they had finished, semi-darkness had settled. Ferguson followed the young man out to the chairs on the porch for a smoke. They were scarcely seated when there was a clatter of hoofs, and a pony and rider came out of the shadow of the nearby cottonwood, approaching the cabin and halting beside the porch. The newcomer was a man of about thirty-five. The light of the kerosene lamp shone fairly in his face as he sat in the saddle, showing a pair of cold, steady eyes and thin, straight lips that were wreathed in a smile. I thought I'd ride over for a smoke and a talk before going down the creek to where the outfit's working, he said to the young man, and now his eyes swept Ferguson's lank figure with a searching glance. But I didn't know you was having company, he added. The second glance that he threw toward Ferguson was not friendly. Ferguson's lips curled slightly under it. Each man had been measured by the other, and neither had found in the other anything to admire. Ferguson's thoughts went rapidly back to Dry Bottom. He saw a man in the street putting five bullets through a can that he had thrown into the air. He saw again the man's face as he had completed his exhibition, insolent, filled with a sneering triumph. He heard again this man's voice as he himself had offered to eclipse his feet. You running sheep, stranger? The voice and face of the man who stood before him now were the voice and face of the man who had preceded him in the shooting match in Dry Bottom. His thoughts were interrupted by the voice of his host, explaining his presence. This here man was bit by a rattler this afternoon, the young man was saying. He's laying up here for tonight. Says he's reckoning on getting a job over at the Two Diamond. 
The man on the horse sneered. Hell, he said. Bit by a rattler. He laughed insolently, pulling his pony's head around. I reckon I'll be going, he said. You'll nurse him so he won't die. He had struck the pony's flanks with the spurs and was gone into the shadows before either man on the porch could move. There was a short silence while the two men listened to the beat of his pony's hoofs. Then Ferguson turned and spoke to the young man. You know him? he questioned. The young man smiled coldly. Yep, yeah, he said. He's range boss for the two diamond. End of chapter 5「Chapter Six of the Two Gun Man by Charles Alden Seltzer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Penn. At the Two Diamond. As Ferguson rode through the pure sunshine of the morning, his thoughts kept going back to the little cabin in the flat. Bear Flat, she had called it. Certain things troubled him. He, whose mind had been always untroubled, even through three months of idleness that had not been exactly attractive. She's certainly got nice eyes, he told himself confidentially, as he lingered slowly on his way. And she knows how to use em. She sure made me seem some breathless, and no girl has ever done that. And her hair is like... He pondered long over this. Like... Why, I reckon I didn't just ever see anything like it. And the way she looked at me. A shadow crossed his face. So she's a writer. And she studied medicine. I reckon I'd like it a heap better if she didn't monkey with none of them fool things. What business has a girl got to... He suddenly laughed aloud. Oh, I reckon I'm pretty near loco, he said to be raving about a girl like this. She ain't nothing to me. She just done what any other girl would do if a man come to her place bit by a rattler. He spurred his pony forward at a sharp lope, and now he found that his thoughts would go back to the moment of his departure from the cabin that morning. She had accompanied him to the door, after bandaging the ankle. Her brother had gone away an hour before. I'm thanking you, ma'am. Ferguson said as he stood for a moment at the door. I reckon I'd have had a bad time if it hadn't been for you. It was nothing, she returned. He had hesitated. He still felt the thrill of doubt that had assailed him before he had taken the step that he knew was impertinent. I'll be riding over here again some day, if you don't mind, he said. Her face reddened a trifle. I'm sure brother would like to have you, she replied. I don't remember to have said that I was coming over to see your brother, was his reply. But it would have to be he, she said, looking straight at him. You couldn't come to see me unless I asked you. And now he had spoken a certain word that had been troubling him. Do you reckon that two diamond range boss comes over to see your brother? She frowned. Of course, she replied. He is my brother's friend. But I, I despise him. Ferguson grinned broadly. Well, now, he said, unable to keep his pleasure over her evident dislike of the two diamond men from showing in his eyes and voice. That's certainly too bad. And to think he's wasting his time riding over here. She gazed at him with steady, unwavering eyes. He could still remember the challenge in them. Be careful that you don't waste your time, was her answer. I reckon I won't, was his reply, as he climbed into the saddle. But I won't be coming over here to see your brother. Oh, dear, she said. I call that very brazen. But when he had spurred his pony down through the crossing of the river... He had turned to glance back at her, and he had seen a smile on her face. As he rode now, he went over this conversation many times, much pleased with his own boldness, more pleased because she had not seemed angry with him. 
It was late in the morning when he caught sight of the Two Diamond Ranch buildings, scattered over a great basin through which the river flowed. Half an hour later, he rode up to the ranch house and met Stafford at the door of the office. The manager waved him inside. I'm two days late, said Ferguson, after he had taken a chair in the office. He related to Stafford the attack by the rattler. The latter showed some concern over the injury. I reckon you didn't do your own doctrine, he asked. Ferguson told him of the girl. The manager's lips straightened. A grim humor shone from his eyes. You stayed there overnight? he questioned. I reckon I stayed there. It was in a cabin down at a place which I heard the girl say was called Bear Flat. I didn't catch the name of the man. Stafford grinned coldly. I reckon they didn't know what you was coming over here for. I didn't advertise, returned Ferguson quietly. If you had, declared Stafford, his eyes glinting with a cold amusement, you would have found things plumb lively. That man's name is Ben Radford. He's a man I'm hiring you to put out of business. For all Stafford could see, Ferguson did not move a muscle. Yet the news had shocked him. He could feel the blood surging rapidly through his veins. But the expression on his face was inscrutable. Well now, he said, that's sure what I made things interesting. And so that's the man you think has been stealing your cattle? He looked steadily at the manager. But I told you before I wasn't doing any shooting. Correct, agreed the manager. What I want you to do is to prove that Radford's the man. We can't do anything till we prove that he's been rustling. And then, he smiled grimly. You reckon to know the girl's name, too? inquired Ferguson. It's Mary, stated the manager. I've heard Leviatt talk about her. Ferguson contemplated the manager gravely. And you ain't sure that Radford's stealing your cattle? Stafford filled and lighted his pipe. I'm taking Dave Leviatt's word for it. Who's Leviatt? inquired Ferguson. My range boss, returned Stafford. He's been riding sign on Radford and says he's responsible for all the stock that we've been missing in the last six months. Ferguson rolled a cigarette. He lighted it and puffed for a moment in silence, the manager watching him. Back at Dry Bottom, said Ferguson presently, there was a man shooting at a can when I struck town. He put five bullets through the can. Was that your range, boss? Stafford smiled. That was Leviatt, my range boss, he returned. We went over to Dry Bottom to get a gunfighter. We wanted a man who could shoot plumb quick. He'd have to be quick for Radford's lightning with a six. Leviatt said shooting at a can would be a good way to find a man who could take Radford's measure, in case it was necessary, he added quickly. Ferguson's face was a mask of immobility. Where's Leviatt now? he questioned. Up the Ute with the outfit. How far up? Thirty miles. Ferguson's eyelashes flickered. Has Leviatt been here lately? he questioned. Not since the day before yesterday. When are you expecting him back? The boys will be coming back in a week. He'll likely come along with them. Uh-huh. You giving me a free hand? Of course. Ferguson flounced at the door. I'm looking around a little, he said, to kind of size up things. I don't want you to put me with the outfit. That strike you right? I'm hiring you to do a certain thing, returned Stafford. I ain't telling you how it ought to be done. You got till the fall roundup to do it. Ferguson nodded. He went to the corral fence, unhitched his pony, and rode out on the plains toward the river. Stafford watched him until he was a mere dot on the horizon. Then he smiled with satisfaction. I kind of like that guy, he said, commenting mentally. There ain't no show work to him, but he's business. End of chapter 6
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Penn. The Measure of a Man. During the week following Ferguson's arrival at the Two Diamond Ranch, Stafford saw very little of him. Morning saw him proceed to the corral, catch up his pony, mount, and depart. He returned with the dusk. Several times from his office window, Stafford had seen him ride away in the moonlight. Ferguson did his own cooking, for the cook had accompanied the wagon outfit down the river. Stafford did not seek out the new man with instructions or advice. The work Ferguson was engaged in, he must do alone. For, if complications should happen to arise, it was the manager's business to know nothing. The Two Diamond Ranch was not unlike many others that dotted the grass plains of the territory. The interminable miles that separated Stafford from the nearest did not prevent him from referring to that particular owner as neighbor, for distances were thus determined, and distances thus determined were nearly always inaccurate. The traveler inquiring for his destination was expected to discover it somewhere in the unknown distance. The Two Diamond Ranch had the inevitable reputation of being slick, which meant that Stafford was industrious and thrifty, and that his ranch bore an appearance of unusual neatness. For example, Stafford believed in the science of irrigation. A fence skirted his buildings, another ran around a large area of good grass, forming a pasture for his horses. His buildings were attractive, even though rough, for they revealed evidence of continued care. His ranch house boasted a sloped roof and paved galleries. A garden in the rear was but another instance of Stafford's industry. He had cattle that were given extraordinary care because they were milkers, for in his youth Stafford had lived on a farm, and he remembered days when his father had sent him out into the meadow to drive the cows home for the milking. There were many other things that Stafford had not forgotten, for chickens scratched promiscuously about the ranch yard occasionally trespassing into the sacred precincts of the garden and the flower beds. His horses were properly stabled during the cold, raw days that came inevitably. His men had little to complain of, and there was a general atmosphere of prosperity over the entire ranch. But of late there had been little contentment for the two diamond manager. For six months, cattle thieves had been at work on his stock. The result of the spring roundup had been far from satisfactory. He knew of the existence of nesters in the vicinity. One of them, Radford, he had suspected upon evidence submitted by the range boss. Radford had been warned to vacate Bear Flat, but the warning had been disregarded. But one other course was left, and Stafford had adopted that. There had been no hesitancy on the manager's part. He must protect the two-diamond property. Sentiment had no place in the situation, whatever. Therefore, towards Ferguson's movements, Stafford adopted an air of studied indifference, not doubting from what he had seen of the man that he would eventually ride in and report that the work which he had been hired to do was finished. Toward the latter end of the week, the wagon outfit straggled in. They came in singly, in twos and threes, bronzed, hardy, seasoned young men, taciturn, serene-eyed, capable. They continued to come until there were twenty-seven of them. Later in the day came the wagon and the remuda. From a period of calm and inaction, the ranch now awoke to life and movement. The bunkhouse was scrubbed, swabbed in the vernacular of the cowboys. The scant bedding was cured in the white sunlight and the cook was adjured to extend himself in the preparation of chuck, meaning food, to repay the men for the lack of good things during a fortnight on the open range with the wagon. At dusk on the first day in, Rope Jones, a tall, lithe young puncher, whose spare moments were passed in breaking the wild horses that occasionally found their way to the Two Diamond, was oiling his saddle leathers, Sitting on a bench outside the bunkhouse, he became aware of Stafford standing near. Leviat come in? queried the manager. The puncher grinned. Nope. The last I seen of Dave, he was hitting the breeze toward Bear Flat. Said he'd be in later. He lowered his voice significantly. Reckon that Radford girl is bothering Dave a heap. 
Stafford smiled coldly and was about to answer when he saw Ferguson dropping from his pony at the corral gate. Following Stafford's gaze, Rope also observed Ferguson. He looked up at Stafford. New man? he questioned. Stafford nodded. He had invented a plausible story for the presence of Ferguson. Sooner or later, the boys would have noticed the latter's absence from the outfit. Therefore, if he advanced his story now, there would be less conjecture later. "'You boys got enough to do,' he said, still watching Ferguson. "'I hired this man to look up strays. I reckon he can put in a heap of time at it.' Rope shot a swift glance upward at the manager's back. Then he grinned furtively. Two gun, he observed quietly, with the bottoms of his holsters tied down. I reckon your stray man ain't for to be monkeyed with. But Stafford had told his story, and knew that within a very little time, Rope would be telling it to the other men. So, without answering, he walked toward the ranch house. Before he reached it, he saw Leviatt unsaddling at the corral gate. When Ferguson with his saddle on his shoulder, on his way to place it on the accustomed peg in the lean-to adjoining the bunkhouse, past Rope, it was by the merest accident that one of the stirrups caught the cinch buckle of Rope's saddle. Not observing the tangle, Ferguson continued on his way. He halted when he felt the stirrup strap drag, turning half around to see what was wrong. He smiled broadly at Rope. "'You reckon them saddles are acquainted?' he said. Rope deftly untangled them. "'I ain't thinking they're relations,' he returned, grinning up at Ferguson. "'Leastways, I never knowed a double cinch and a center fire to get real chummy.' "'I reckon you're right,' returned Ferguson, his eyes gleaming cordially. "'And I've knowed men to lose their tempers discussing whether a center fire or a double cinch was the most satisfying. "'Some men is plum fools.' returned Rope, surveying Ferguson with narrow, pleased eyes. You didn't observe that the saddles rode any easier after the argument than before? I didn't observe, but maybe the men was more satisfied. Let a man argue that something he's got is better than something that another fellow's got, and he falls right in love with his own, and goes right on falling in love with it. Nothing can ever change his mind after an argument. I know a man who's been studying human nature, observed Rope, grinning. And not wasting his time arguing fool questions, added Ferguson. You sure ain't plum greenhorn, declared Rope admiringly. Thank you, smiled Ferguson. I wasn't looking to see whether you'd cut your eye teeth either. Well now, remarked Rope, rising and shouldering his saddle. You've almost convinced me that a double cinch ain't a bad saddle. Seems to make a man plumb good-humored. When a man's hungry and right close to the place where he is going to feed, said Ferguson gravely, he hadn't ought to bother his head about nothing. You're sitting at my right hand at the table, remarked Rope, delighted with his new friend. Several of the men were already at the wash trough when Rope and Ferguson reached there. The method by which they performed their ablutions was not delicate, but it was thorough. And when the dust had been removed, their faces shone with a dusky health bloom that told of their hard, healthy method of living. Men of various ages were there, grizzled riders who saw the world through the introspective eyes of experience, young men with their enthusiasms, their impulses, middle-aged men who had seen much of life, enough to be able to face the future with unshaken complacence, but all bronzed, clear-eyed, self-reliant, unafraid. When Ferguson and Rope entered the bunkhouse, many of the men were already seated. Ferguson and Rope took places at one end of the long table and began eating. No niceties of the conventions were observed here. The men ate, each according to his whim, and were immune from criticism. Table etiquette was a thing that would have spoiled their joy of eating. Theirs was a primitive country, their occupation primitive, their manner of living no less so. They concerned themselves very little with the customs of a world of which they heard very little. Nor did they bolt their food silently, as has been recorded of them by men who know them little. 
If they did eat rapidly, it was because the ravening hunger of a healthy stomach demanded instant attention, and they did not overeat. Epicurus would have marveled at the simplicity of their food. Conversation was mingled with every mouthful. At one end of the table sat an empty plate, with no man on the bench before it. This was the place reserved for Leviatt, the range boss. Next to this place on the right was seated a good-looking young puncher, whose age might have been estimated at twenty-three. Skinny, they called him, because of his exceeding slenderness. At the moment Ferguson settled into his seat, the young man was filling the room with rapid talk. This talk had been inconsequential, and concerned only with those small details about which we bothered during our leisure. But now his talk veered, and he was suddenly telling something that gave promise of consecutiveness and universal interest. Other voices died away as his arose. Leviat ain't the only one, he was saying. She ain't made no exception with any of the outfit. To my knowin', there's been Lon Dexter, Soapy, Clem Miller, Lazy, Wrinkles, and myself, he admitted, reddening. Been notified that we was mavericks and needed our ears marked. And now comes Leviatt, a uh, fannin' right on to get his, and I reckon he'll get it. You ain't tellin' what she said when she give you yearn, said a voice. There was a laugh, through which the youth emerged smiling broadly. No, he said. I ain't tellin', but she told Soapy here that she was looking for local color. Wanted to know if he was it. Since then, Soapy's been using a right smart lot of soap, trying to rub some color into his face. Color was in Soapy's face now. He sat directly opposite the slender youth, and his cheeks were crimson. I reckon if you keep to the truth, he began, but Skinny had passed on to the next. And there's Dexter. Lon's been awful quiet since she told him he had a picturesque name. Said it'd do for to put into a book, which she's going to write. But when it come to choosing a husband, she'd prefer to tie up to a commoner name. And so Lon didn't graze on that range no more. This country's going plumb to, sneered Dexter. But a laugh silenced him. And the youth continued. It might have been fixed up for Lazy, he went on. Only when she found out his name was Lazy, she wanted to know right off if he could support a wife, providing he got one. He said he reckoned he could, and she told him he could experiment on some other woman. And now Lazy will have to look around quite a spell before he'll get another chance. I'd call that being in mighty poor luck. Lazy was giving his undivided attention to his plate. And she come right out and told Wrinkles he was too old, that when she was thinking of getting wedded to some old monolith, she'd send word to Egypt, where they keep em in stock. Beats me where she gets all them words. Told me she studied her dictionary, said a man who sat near Ferguson. The young man grinned. Well, I swear if I didn't come near to forgetting Clem Miller, he said. If you hadn't spoke up then, I reckon you wouldn't have been in on this deal. And so she told you she studied her dictionary. Now I call that news. Someone been telling me that she'd asked you the meaning of the word evaporate. And when you couldn't tell her, she told you to do it said that when you got home you might look up a dictionary and then you'd know what she meant and now leviatt's hanging around over there continued the youth he's claiming to be going to see ben radford but i reckon he's got the same kind of sickness as the rest of us and you ain't saying a word about what she said to you observed miller she must have treated you awful gentle seeing you won't tell well returned the young man i ain't laying it all out to you but i'll tell you this much she said she was going to make me one of the characters in that book she's writing well now said miller that's sure letting you down easy did she say what the character was going to be 
I reckon she did. And now you're going to tell us, boys? And now I'm going to tell you, boys, returned Skinny. But I reckon there's a drove of them characters here. You'll find them with every outfit, and you'll know them chiefly by their bray and their long, hairy ears. The young man now smiled into his plate, while a chorus of laughter rose around him. In making himself appear as ridiculous a figure as the others, the young man had successfully extracted all the sting from his story, and gained the applause of even those at whom he had struck. But now a sound was heard outside, and Leviatt came into the room. He nodded shortly, and took his place at the end of the table. A certain reserve came into the atmosphere of the room. No further reference was made to the subject that had aroused laughter but several of the men snickered into their plates over the recollection of Leviatt's connection with the incident. As the meal continued, Leviatt's gaze wandered over the table, resting finally upon Ferguson. The range boss's face darkened. Ferguson had seen Leviatt enter. Several times during the course of the meal, he felt Leviatt looking at him. Once, toward the end, his glance met the range boss's fairly. Leviatt's eyes glittered evilly. Ferguson's lips curled with a slight contempt. And yet these men had met but twice before. A man meets another in North America, in the Antipodes. He looks upon him, meets his eye, and instantly has won a friend or made an enemy. Perhaps this will always be true of men. Certainly it was true of Ferguson and the range boss. What force was at work in Leviatt when in Dry Bottom he had insulted Ferguson? Whatever the force, it had told him that the steady-eyed, deliberate gunman was henceforth to be an enemy. Enmity, hatred, evil intent shone out of his eyes as they met Ferguson's. Beyond the slight curl of the lips, the latter gave no indication of feeling, and after the exchange of glances, he resumed eating, apparently unaware of Leviatt's existence. Later, the men straggled from the bunkhouse, seeking the outdoors to smoke and talk. Upon the bench just outside the door, several of the men sat. Others stood at a little distance or lounged in the doorway. With rope, Ferguson had come out and was standing near the door, talking. The talk was light, turning to trivial incidents of the day's work, things that are the monotony of the cowboy life. Presently, Leviatt came out and joined the group. He stood near Ferguson mingling his voice with the others. For a little time the talk flowed easily, and much laughter rose. Then, suddenly above the good-natured babble, came a harsh word. Instantly the other voices ceased, and the men of the group centered their glances upon the range boss, for the harsh word had come from him. He had been talking to a man named Tucson, and it was to the latter that he had now spoken. There's a heap of rattlers in this country he had said. Evidently, the statement was irrelevant, for Tucson's glance at Leviatt's face was uncomprehending. But Leviatt did not wait for an answer. A man might easily claim to have been bit by one of them, he continued, his voice falling coldly. The men of the group sat in a tense silence, trying to penetrate this mystery that had suddenly silenced their talk. Steady eyes searched out each face in an endeavor to discover the man at whom the range boss was talking. They did not discover him. Ferguson stood near Leviatt, an arm's length distant, his hands on his hips. Perhaps his eyes were more alert than those of the other men, his lips in a straighter line. But apparently he knew no more of this mystery than any of the others. And now Leviatt's voice rose again, insolent carrying an unmistakable personal application. Stanford hires a stray man, he said, sneering. This man claims to have been bit by a rattler and lays up overnight in Ben Radford's cabin, making love to Mary Radford. Ferguson turned his head slightly, surveying the range boss with a cold, alert eye. A little while ago, he said evenly, I heard a man inside telling about some of the boys learning their lessons from my girl over on Bear Flat. I reckon, Leviatt, that you've been over there to learn yearn. And now you got to let these boys know. 
Just a rustle it was, a snake-like motion, and then Ferguson's gun was out, its cold muzzle pressed deep into the pit of Leviatt's stomach, and Ferguson's left hand was pinning Leviatt's right to his side, the range boss's hand still wrapped around the butt of his half-drawn weapon. Then came Ferguson's voice again, dry, filled with a quiet earnestness. I ain't gonna hurt you. You're still tenderfoot with a gun. I just wanted to show these boys that you're a false alarm. I reckon they know that now. Leviatt sneered. There was a movement behind Ferguson. Tucson's gun was halfway out of his holster. And then arose Rope's voice as his weapon came out and menaced Tucson. Three in this game would make it odd, Tucson, he said quietly. If there's going to be any shooting, let's have an even break, anyway. Tucson's hand fell away from his holster. He stepped back toward the door, away from the range boss and Ferguson. Levy's face had crimsoned. Maybe I was running a little bit wild, he began. That's coming down right handsome, said Ferguson. He sheathed his gun and deliberately turned his back on Leviatt. The latter stood silent for a moment, his face gradually paling. Then he turned to where Tucson had taken himself, and, with his friend, entered the bunkhouse. In an instant, the old talk arose, and the laughter, but many furtive glances swept Ferguson as he stood, talking quietly with Rowe. The following morning, Stafford came upon Rowe, while the latter was throwing the saddle on his pony down at the corral gate. I heard something about some trouble between Dave Leviatt and the new stray man, said Stafford. I reckon it wasn't serious. Rope turned a grave eye upon the manager. Shucks, he returned. I reckon it wasn't nothing serious, only, he continued with twitching lips, Dave was taking the stray man's measure. Stafford smiled grimly. How did the stray man measure up? he inquired, a smile working at the corners of his mouth. I reckon he wasn't none shy. Rope grinned, admiration glinting in his eyes. He's sure man size, he returned, giving his attention to the saddle cinch. End of chapter 7、Chapter 8 of The Two Gun Man by Charles Alden Seltzer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Penn. The Finding of the Orphan. During the first few days of his connection with the Two Diamond, Ferguson had reached the conclusion that he would do well to take plenty of time to inquire into the situation before attempting any move. He had now been at the Two Diamond for two weeks, and he had not even seen Radford, nor had he spoken half a dozen words with Stafford. The manager had observed certain signs that had convinced him that speech with the stray man was unnecessary and futile. If he purposed to do anything, he would do it in his own time and in his own way. Stafford mentally decided that the stray man was set in his ways. The wagon outfit had departed, this time down the river. Rope Jones had gone with the wagon, and therefore Ferguson was deprived of the companionship of a man who had unexpectedly taken a stand with him in his clash with Leviatt, and for whom he had conceived a great liking. With the wagon had gone Leviatt also. During the week that had elapsed between the clash at the bunkhouse and the departure of the wagon, the range boss had given no sign that he knew of the existence of Ferguson, nor had he intimated by word or sign that he meditated revenge upon Rope because of the latter's championship of the stray man. If he had any such intention, he concealed it with consummate skill. He treated Rope with a politeness that drew smiles to the faces of the men. But Ferguson saw in this politeness a subtleness of purpose that gave him additional light on the range boss's character. A man who held his vengeance at his fingertips would have taken pains to show Rope that he might expect no mercy. Had Leviatt revealed an open antagonism to Rope, the latter might have known what to expect when at last the two men would reach the open range and the puncher be under the direct domination of the man he had offended. There were many ways in which a petty vengeance might be gratified. It was within the range boss's power to make life nearly unbearable for the puncher. If he did this, it would, of course, be an unworthy vengeance, and Ferguson had little doubt that any vengeance meditated by Leviatt would not be petty. 
Ferguson went his own way, deeply thoughtful. He was taking his time. Certain things were puzzling him. Where did Leviatt stand in this rustling business? That was part of the mystery. Stafford had told him that he had Leviatt's word that Radford was the thief who had been stealing the two-diamond cattle. Stafford had said also that it had been Leviatt who had suggested employing a gunfighter, had even gone to Dry Bottom with the manager for the purpose of finding one, and now that one had been employed, Leviatt had become suddenly antagonistic to him, and Leviatt was in the habit of visiting the Radford cabin. Of course he might be doing this for the purpose of spying upon Ben Radford, but if that were the case, why had he shown so venomous when he had seen Ferguson sitting on the porch on the evening of the day after the latter had been bitten by the rattler? Mary Radford had told him that Leviatt was her brother's friend. If he was a friend of the brother, why had he suggested that Stafford employ a gunfighter to shoot him? Here was more mystery. On a day soon after the departure of the wagon outfit, he rode away through the afternoon sunshine. Not long did his thoughts dwell upon the mystery of the range boss in Ben Radford. He kept seeing a young woman kneeling in front of him, bathing and binding his foot. Scraps of a conversation that he had not forgotten revolved in his mind and brought smiles to his lips. She didn't need to act so plumb serious when she told me that I didn't know that I had any right to sit there and make pretty speeches to her. She wouldn't need to ask me to stay at the cabin all night. I could have gone on to Two Diamond. I reckon that snake bite wasn't so plumb dangerous that I'd have died if I'd rode a little while. As he came out of a little gully a few miles upriver and rode along the crest of a ridge that rose above endless miles of plains, his thoughts went back to that first night in the bunkhouse when the outfit had come in from the range. Satisfaction glinted in his eyes. I reckon them boys didn't make good with her, and I expect that some day Leviatt will find he's been wasting his time. He frowned at thought of Leviatt, and unconsciously his spurs drove hard against the pony's flanks. The little animal sprang forward, tossing his head spiritedly. Ferguson grinned and patted his flank with a remorseful hand. "'Well, now, Mustard,' he said, "'I wasn't reckoning on taking my spite out on you. "'You don't expect I thought you was Leviatt.' And he patted the flank again. He rode down the long slope of the rise and struck the level, traveling at a slow lope through a shallow washout. The ground was broken and rocky here, and the snake-like cactus caught at his stirrup leathers. A rattler warned from the shadow of some sagebrush, and remembering his previous experience, he paused long enough to shoot his head off. There, he said, surveying the shattered snake. I reckon you ain't to blame for me being bit by your uncle or cousin or something. But I ain't never going to be particular when I see one of your family swinging their head that suggestive. He rode on again, reloading his pistol. For a little time he traveled at a brisk pace, and then he halted to breathe mustard. Throwing one leg over the pommel, he turned halfway round in the saddle and swept the plains with a casual glance. He sat erect instantly, focusing his gaze upon a speck that loomed through a dust cloud some miles distant. For a time he watched the speck, his eyes narrowing. Finally, he made out the speck to be a man on a pony. He's a fanning it some, he observed, shading his eyes with his hands. Hitting up the breeze for fair. He meditated long, a critical smile reaching his lips. It's right warm today, not just the kind of atmosphere that a man ought to be running his horse reckless in. He meditated again. How far would you say is off, Mustard? Ten mile? I'd reckon you'd say if you was a knowing horse. The horseman had reached a slight ridge, and for a moment he appeared on the crest of it, racing his pony toward the river. Then he suddenly disappeared. Ferguson smiled coldly. Again his gaze swept the plains and the ridges about him. I don't see nothing that make a man ride like that in this heat, he said. Where would he have come from? He stared obliquely off at a deep gully, almost hidden by an adjoining ridge. It's been pretty near an hour since I shot that snake. I didn't see no man about that time. If we was around here, he must have heard my gun and sloped. 
He smiled and urged his pony about. I reckon we'll go look around that gully a little, Mustard, he said. Half an hour later, he rode down into the gully. After going some little distance, he came across a dead cow, lying close to an overhanging rock rim. A bullet hole in the cow's forehead told eloquently of the manner of her death. Ferguson dismounted and laid a hand on her side. The body was still warm. A four-month's calf was nudging the mother with an inquisitive muzzle. Ferguson took a sharp glance at its ears, and then drove it off to get a look at the brand. There was none. Sleeper, he said quietly, with the two diamond earmark. Most range bosses make a mistake in not branding their calves. Seems as if they're trusting to luck that rustlers won't work on them. I must have scared this one off. He swung into the saddle, a queer light in his eyes. Mustard, old boy, we're going to a bear flat. Maybe Radford's hanging around there now, and maybe he ain't. But we're going to see. But he halted a moment to bend a pitying glance at the calf. Poor little doggie, he said. Poor little orphan. Losing your mother, just like a human being. I call that mean luck. Then he was off, mustard swinging in a steady lope down the gully and up toward the ridge that led to the river trail. End of chapter 8